Welcome in, first and long college football fans. I am your co-host, Mark. Mason, how you doing today, bud? Doing well, Mark. Uh, we just we just wrapped up with SEC Media Days uh, yesterday. Uh, it's, it's now Friday night, so um, we've we've seen all the coaches speak. We, um, we, we got to hear a little bit about them, a lot about them in some cases. And, um, and now it's time to move forward into uh, fall camp here soon in a few weeks. And uh, that, that's, that's exciting. So we'll, we'll definitely have some more news to break once that happens. But in the meantime, uh, we've got plenty to talk about as we prepare for what is shaping up to be a very interesting season. Uh, and later in the show, I'm excited to get into uh, what are going to be our best matchups. Uh, but, uh, but Mark, I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer that same question. What, what's your night looking like tonight? Oh man, it's a, uh, it's a, a Friday night in the summertime and, and I'm getting to talk some college football, uh, with a bunch of fanatics. So, uh, I'm, I'm having a good old time drinking me a cold one. Um, you know, been hanging out with the kids, like, like everybody watching some baseball, uh, got our, got our Braves playing right now. Um, so steadily over here checking scores and, and, and looking at college football stuff. So I'm super excited. And, and before we get going, guys, I, I just want to tell everybody, thank you for, for watching the videos. We're just getting started here on the first and long college football podcast. And, um, you know, we're looking to, to serve our viewers, uh, the best that we can. So please leave us a comment, uh, like subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, we're, we're going to be here multiple days a week and, and putting out lots of content throughout the college football season. And as of right now, we're, we're about uh, 40 days away. So it, time is a ticking and it will be here before you know it. Uh, and SEC Media Days is, is definitely the start of the season uh, for most people and coaches and, and players and fans alike. So uh, what, what were your takeaways from today? We had three teams left, right? What what teams do we have left, and and what were you, what were your thoughts uh, from today and the the coaches that that uh, spoke and answered questions? Yeah, so today it was uh, Lane Kiffin, Shane Beamer, and then Josh Heupel to close. Um, yep. As you would expect, Lane Kiffin was the most interesting uh, of the three. Um, definitely some some. Uh, some some lane moments, right? Some Kiffinisms were were uh, uh, amongst us, and uh, it was uh, it was fun to watch. Really fun to watch, and uh, we'll we'll get more into that later. Um, I thought Josh Heupel he had to address um, the the ruling that was handed to Tennessee uh, that that wasn't his doing, right? So he he didn't answer much uh, many questions about that, um, but I you know as the man with the, with that uh that that T on his chest you know with the microphone he he's the one who had to address it and I thought he did well with that um again it, it's not it's not something that he did they they weren't allegations against him as the head coach but um you know he he handled it with grace I thought um and yeah uh I thought it was interesting that Joe Milton was with Tennessee uh you know that that usually these the three players that are selected are, are leaders, right. For the program. And, um, you know, for him being a, a first year quarterback, sometimes you don't see coaches, uh, go with that, you know, and it's, it's not a huge pick or anything like that, but I think that, uh, the, the off season hype is real for Joe Milton. Um, we know that he's, he's got this massive arm, a uh, huge arm talent. Um, I think that, that, with him being the lead guy all, all throughout the off season um, and, and getting all of those reps, he, he should, he should be poised to take another step forward and be uh, one of those, one of those players that's on every, every NFL team's draft board, right. Uh, moving, moving forward into the season. Um, and then Shane, uh, Shane was being Shane, you know, uh, really fun coach. I have, have a lot of respect for him and, uh, you know, he, he brought in uh, Spencer Rattler, which, which which nobody nobody would question that. Uh, I, I think I think South Carolina is poised for a great season as well. They're kind of that that sleeper team in the SEC uh, East, and uh, bringing back I guess fifth year now Spencer Rattler. You know, people forget just just uh, three seasons ago he 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 was he was at Oklahoma um, and was a Heisman contender. 
you know, going into to uh, that season in 21, I believe it was, you know, he's he was expected to win the Heisman. I, I believe at one point he was the odds on favorite. So um, a, a massive talent there. Um, I, I think he may have faced some humility after getting beat out in Oklahoma um, and then coming to the SEC, you know, thinking he, he maybe thinking that that he was going to, you know, uh, re-spark his career, you know, uh, over over in the SEC and realize it's uh, it's a different league, you know, than, than the Big 12. So maybe a little bit of humble pie was served up to him. And, and uh, he's he certainly he, he certainly has the tools to to take his skill to the next level. Uh, makes just to see kind of how that how that looks for him uh, coming into the 2023 season. Um, but, you know, going back to you now, what what were your takeaways from, you know, as we close SEC Media Day? Uh, where do you want to go with this? Well, uh, kind of starting in the same order that you did there. Um, you know, Ole Miss, um, I, I feel like they're such a hard team to get your, your head around. They brought so many guys in. Lane Kiffin said today that they've got 40 new scholarship players. Um, and, I mean, that, that type of thing is just unprecedented. So we're going to see, you know, if he can turn that into to wins on the field. And Ole Miss was such an interesting team to me last year. They started off 8-1 um, and one and then just fell apart. And, and one of the things that Lane talked about today was that the, the team, uh, he let the team kind of fall apart. And, you know, I, I'm no coach. I'm no X's and O's guy. You know, I don't have any insider knowledge or anything. I'm just a college football fan, you know. But it, it seems to me that it, it, whenever you build these teams with nothing but transfers, I feel like there's more of a propensity for uh, these guys to kind of quit on you, right? I mean, I, I'm not saying that they're all quitters or losers or something, because obviously that's not the case. There's, there's obviously great kids that are transferring, but um, they did quit on their last team. Right. And, and it makes you wonder about these kids that are transferring two, three, four times, you know, it, it, it makes you wonder about their character a little bit, you know, and, and, and um, but anyway, it, Lane uh, was, was, not super complimentary of the situation that that everybody's been put in with the transfer portal. Uh, he compared it to NFL and NBA players just being able to play for a team for a couple months and decide that they don't want to be there anymore and and they're gone. Um, you know, and and whenever you put it into retrospect like that, I mean, how could you possibly manage something? You know, where where there's that type of back and forth with with even if you're managing a business or something, employees, I mean, you could never, never get any kind of rhythm or build any kind of culture or anything like that. So um, I, I, it was interesting what Lane had to say. And uh, I feel like Lane is uses his platform um, to try and uh, bring issues to light that, that a lot of people, you know, a lot of people just don't even think about or would, or what, you know, as they would say, casuals would just wouldn't even understand. Um, so Lane did a lot of complaining, I guess you could say, uh, but w was it rightful? Yeah, I, I do think it was rightful. Um, but uh, with this old Miss team, uh, you know, they brought in a, a transfer quarterback, Spencer, uh, Sanders. Um, they brought in a, a transfer wide receiver. Uh, they brought in just tons of transfers on the defense. So, and they bring in Pete Golden to run the defense. What, what's your outlook on them this year? How do you feel about Ole Miss this year and and where they're headed? Yeah, I'm actually really high on Ole Miss. Um, I, I think that that this. I, I mean, you're right. You know, you brought up the fact that that they brought in over forty, um, or forty or more transfers and, um. You know, just with the quarterbacks alone, they bring in not only Spencer Sanders but Walker Howard from LSU as transfers um, yeah. to three couple with their to couple with their starter Jackson Dart. So you've got a three quarterback competition, and I haven't heard much uh, to be honest coming out of um, Oxford, Mississippi. Um, 
as far as how that quarterback competition is shaping up, I don't know much about it, but um, I tell you, they have two of easily the top 10 running backs in the SEC. Number one in my book, Quinshawn Judkins. Um, it, he's the number one SEC uh, running back right now in my book and, and is a, a true Heisman contender. Um, but also Ulysses Bentley, the fourth. Um, this is a guy who, uh, if you're into FPS, you, you know this was a guy that you could you could catch uh, at a low rate at a low price and get a lot out of him. Uh, he was he was a producer. He's a power back, and um, he's he's the thunder to Quinshawn Judkins Lightning, and uh, they are a a, a dynamic one two punch. Um, also bringing in, I'm just looking at their depth chart here. They they got a a redshirt junior transfer Trey Harris who will be their starting X, and a senior transfer in. Zachary Franklin, uh, who will be their Z, and also a tight end transfer. Who th These are all starters for them. So you've got three starters coming in as transfers. Um, and then on the defensive side of the ball, without you know naming all of them, uh, you've also got four four starters coming in. So uh, that's a lot. For, for, for most championship contending teams, if you bring in two starters out of 22 – um, out of the transfer portal, that's a that's a big that's a big shakeup, you know. And and for Lane, um, gosh, uh, he's he's got seven right here uh, easily, and that's not including if Spencer Sanders ends, ends up starting over Jackson Dart, so or Walker Howard, uh, for that matter. But but I think that this is. You know, you know, and you, and you mentioned um, you mentioned Lane in his press conference. He was talking about how last season he didn't keep the team motivated well enough after the loss to Alabama, right? That's that's the point that he pointed to and said, "That's where I could have gotten better. I could have been more of a motivator, like we know Kirby and Nick Saban are doing." Right? These guys are are real, you know, motivators more than. Uh, more than most coaches, and I think that's a big part of their success. So I think he looked at that and reflected on that a little bit and said, you know, maybe I let my team down, right? And and for him in his fourth season with Ole Miss to to be, you know, still still able to grow. Um, excuse me, I saw in that I saw in that press conference with Lane that he did a lot of reflecting, and I think that that's going to bode well for for his Rebels, um, and you know, for him in the future. So I'm anxious to see them. I, I, I really do think that they're kind of a, a sleeper team. I have them as, um, I guess I have them at four in the SEC West. I have them finishing fourth um, behind LSU, Alabama, and Texas A&M this season. So um, pretty, that's kind of right where they were last season, I guess. But I think that Texas A&M finally gets the bump. But uh, that, that's not to say that I think that they're they're not a, a great team. I, I really do think that they're um, going to be a pretty strong team and um, just one of those teams that, that goes through the gauntlet of the SEC West and, you know, it obviously uh, doesn't do any doesn't do them any favors. Right. For the schedule. So um, I was uh, I was really, you know, going back to the press conference, I was uh, I was expecting fireworks with Lane Kiffin. I think I think we got those fireworks um and it was really interesting to to watch him uh talk about free agency in college football um you know and 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 being lane you know i don't know if you if you saw but he he called out uh paul feinbaum and told him to stop pissing pissing saving off because it doesn't make it any easier for the rest of them <laughs> in the sec <laughs> so yeah, that awful. was pretty funny that was pretty funny. And they get, they got into a little bit of a, a back and forth, you know, and um, Paul Feinbaum didn't like that for some reason. He got a little chippy about it. So it was, it was yeah. kind of funny to watch, but uh, it was all in good fun at, at the end of the day. Um, yeah. And then also uh, there was another reporter I saw today on Twitter who uh, I think it was like his last question in, in sort of the, so, so, so in these, in these SEC media days, uh, the coaches come out and they, you know, stand at their podium. They do their 10 minute, um, you know, opening remarks and they open up for questions. And then after that, they go into a back room 
and more reporters follow the man and they sit down and they go into more questions. Well, at the end of that second session, a reporter <laughs> said something about how he gets mistaken for Lane Kiffin all the time, you know, and he asked Lane Kiffin, he's like, do we, do you think we look alike? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was so funny uh, just That's hearing funny. Lane's, you know, reaction, you know, and he's like, man, I, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, that you get, you get confused for me, but uh, you know, I, it, it, it was it was it was pretty funny to watch, but um, just to see that reaction and to see Lane being Lane and, yeah. and cutting up before the season starts. Um, but what about uh, it, what, did you first of all did you have any other remarks for Ole Miss? And if not, what what were your takes for uh, Tennessee and Josh Heupel? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, um, as far as Ole Miss goes, uh, I, my questions are not on the offense this year. I, I think the offense is going to be very good. Quinshawn Judkins is, I definitely think he's the best running back in the SEC, um, probably top five in the game right now, uh, right there with Rocket Sanders. They, they had com comparable numbers last year, honestly. Um, this was one of the best Russian teams in all of football last year, and um, it, it looks to me from everything that I've read and I've heard about that Jackson Dorr is going to be the guy. He had the best spring game. And, uh, but, you know, they've just got some big losses, man. You know, at wide receiver, they lose Mingo and Heath. Uh, at tight end, they lose Michael Trigg. Uh, at cornerback, they lost Davidson. Uh, I, this guy's name is hard for me. It's Ig, Igben, Igbonason. Um, he left to Ohio State. Miles Battle to Utah. Uh, Tysheen Johnson to Oregon. Um, you know, it, it's just a ton of losses. Now, this defense was not good anyway. So to lose those cornerbacks, is that a big deal? Probably not. It, it's probably not that big a deal, I guess. But if you want this defense to be better, then then you want guys to come back, right? I mean, you would think naturally guys would, would progress if they stay in the system another year, um, even though they do get a new defensive coordinator. But all three of those guys in the, in the secondary were going to start. Or or play significant time uh, at, at the very least. So I, I don't know if they hit the portal just right for the secondary. Uh, we've talked about these SEC teams. There's there's a few sec Alabama and Georgia have great secondaries, and then I haven't seen another great one since we've been reviewing these teams. But then again, there's not a ton of great quarterbacks in the SEC this year, right? So in theory, maybe it's a decent year for that. Uh, for that type of situation and, and maybe they can they can make lemonade out of lemons there that at old miss um and who who you want to go to next mason um yeah so so wrapping it up with with shane beamer um there wasn't a lot to gleam um I, I'm sorry, we, we we completely skipped over uh, Tennessee. We were going to go to Tennessee next, so so, so let's go with the balls. Let's go with the balls oh, first. Um, yeah. I am very high on the balls this season. Um, the reason being, I I just think that it's going to be really hard for for teams on their schedule to keep up with them offensively right they have um, um those have been well documented uh and i just don't i just i i don't think that they did enough to uh to move the needle very much um but i mean just looking at their schedule they really don't have they've got florida on september 16th which Shouldn't be an issue uh, if they are as good as I think that they are. Uh, and then South Carolina, September 30th. That's going to be a big weekend in college football alone. But here's here's the here's the issue here. So September 30th against South Carolina, they take a week off, and then they've got Texas A&M, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that's a really tough game for Tennessee. I don't think Texas A&M – is going to be able to keep up with this with this offense, right? I, I think Tennessee is going to be able to hang 40 on Texas A&M, which is a really good defense, but I don't think that they're quite to, to Georgia's level. 
uh, as a defense. So I think that Tennessee is going to be able to score against them uh, pretty well. Um, and I, I don't see Texas A&M having the juice to be able to keep up with them. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Now you got to go to Tuscaloosa the very next week. That's that's a trap game, or not even a trap game. I mean, you're 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 not going to be favored to beat Alabama more than likely, right? Yeah. Unless uh, halfway through the season, Alabama's just falling apart. Um, but I, 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 without looking at Alabama's schedule, I don't see that happening that early in the season. So I would expect both teams to be undefeated going into that game, and. Uh, Without looking at Alabama's schedule, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't see how Tennessee's not going, you know, to be uh, beat up a little bit after after you know facing Texas A and M like that. Um, but it's going to be interesting. Alabama is really the only only uh, for sure loss outside of or uh, outside of Georgia that I see. Um, and, you know, outside of that, they've got non-cons against Connecticut, UTSA, Austin P, and Virginia. So um, they're, I think that they're definitely looking at a 10-2 and two season, and, uh, you know, they'll be, they'll be in a New Year's Six Bowl. Um, I think that they have the team to beat Alabama. I just don't like the fact that it comes right after Texas A&M, who's a very talented and physical football team, and um, – that that that's the that's the issue. It's a schedule concern to me for Tennessee. It's not like a power rating concern for me. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, well, I think that Josh Heupel has definitely changed things at at Tennessee. I mean, things things are different than they were a few years ago, and I think the expectations have definitely changed. But I, I just feel like with the with Joe Milton, I just feel like this is the same old song and dance uh, we've seen this guy over and over and i know he can throw it 90 yards and and the best way i think i can put it is joe milton is a very extremely talented thrower of the football but he has got to become a passer he throwing it 90 yards is not going to do you a damn bit of good if your receiver is 82 yards out and I think Tennessee will have a decent run game. I, I, offense is not the question for me. It's just not the question. Uh, this, they've got to play some complimentary football, man. I mean, these teams like Tennessee and Ohio State, and um, you know, there's obviously others that I'm not thinking about right the second, but they've got to understand that the football is played on more than one side of the ball. And until Tennessee stops leaving their defense out to dry, they're not going to get to where they want to go. And, and I'm not saying they're going to have a bad year. I don't think Tennessee's going to have a bad year. Uh, I think, like you just said, the, everything with the schedule, I think it all shapes up. I don't think no matter where Alabama fell this year, I don't think they beat Alabama. And the mm -hmm. reason I say that is, is I have a lot of confidence right now in that Bama secondary. and. Uh, Caleb Downs is about to be the truth, brother. Mm -hmm. He's about to mm -hmm. be the truth. This guy is about to come in and and dominate. I have a, a very serious, this is like a Minka Fitzpatrick type situation with this guy. Um, but, oh, the thunder's hitting in the background there. Uh, but, no, I, I think they reload on at wide receiver. You got, you got Squirrel White who... You know, I've heard some Tennessee fans calling into some shows saying, oh, he's faster than, you know, Pillman or, or, or Hyatt. Or, I, I doubt that. I doubt he's faster than them. But the point being, receiver wasn't the problem last year. So more good wide receivers coming in to replace those guys, that's a great thing. But I don't think it solves the, the problem of getting over the hump to, to 11 and 1. That, I think Tennessee's best chance this year of making a playoff is if Georgia goes undefeated, Tennessee takes that L to Georgia, which I think they will, but they go 11-1, and one, and they're sitting right there to pounce because that's what would have happened last year. But then they take this trip to South Carolina, and it's like a different Tennessee team, and South Carolina just stomped a mud hole in their butt and walked it dry. I mean, let's just be real about it. Scored 60, what, 63 points on them, uh, which is exactly my point. 
uh, they've got to stop somebody this year. And I don't want anybody to take it the wrong way. I'm not, I'm not saying Tennessee is going to be a bad team. I think they're very talented. I think uh, uh, Heupel has done a good job there. I think, I think a 9-3, and 10-2 and two is, is what's most likely. Um, as a you know, football fan, I, I wouldn't mind seeing Tennessee go 11-1, and one, you know, lose to Georgia and make the playoffs. And, <clears throat> and I would love to see that. This is the last year of the four team. And Tennessee, if they keep this up, you know, uh, when that 12-team playoff comes, they're going to be in it almost every year. Yeah, I think that that's – that's what I, that was my next point is is I think this is a a Tennessee team that's that's here to stay it's here for the long haul. Um, Joe Milton will be leaving after this season. You've got Nico Iamalieva coming in uh, as the you know he's the the five star quarterback and heck we might see him this season. I think if yeah. if uh, Joe Milton's not getting it done, if they've got two losses heading into that Alabama game, maybe Nico gets gets the call you know, um, or, or has already gotten the call, uh, at that point. But, um, but yeah, and, and well, you, you know, you got Nico coming in, they just got a, a commitment from a five-star wide receiver, Mike Williams, uh, out of, um, out of Georgia, out of Gwinnett County. And, um, you know, they're building, they're, they're getting some pieces here. Hey, if you're a wide receiver, um, you, why would you not want to go to Tennessee? I mean, I, I totally understand you know why somebody would want to go there uh, they're going to they're going to use the ever living heck out of you if, if you're really a, a five star athlete um if you're a quarterback or a wide receiver um man Tennessee is a good spot for you uh, there there's really no doubt about that honestly an offensive lineman as well you know and, and one thing that i thought about is um at the end of this season so if if we're kind of correct in thinking that Tennessee ends up, you know, 10 and two or nine and three. Um, I'm also of the belief that USC is going to be about a 10, nine or 10 win, win team. And I'd love to see that matchup and see those two offenses go, you know, clash and um, just how that might play out. You know, I I guess 110 to 108. I know. I know that's, you know, you were talking about teams that don't play complimentary football. Well, USC is definitely one of them. Um, but, you know, I, I guess at that point, it's, it's kind of, you know, uh, whether or not, um, you know, whether or not everybody plays if they're not in a playoff game, because, you know, this day and age, you know, yeah. if, if you're a Heisman winning quarterback and, and Caleb Williams, I mean, are you really going to risk your, your, your uh, draft status to, to go play in a, a Rose Bowl, you know? That's not a playoff game, maybe not. Uh, I don't know. Right. I don't know the probably, answer to probably that. Probably not that, that that close to the draft. I wouldn't imagine. But uh, hypothetically, that'd be a really fun game to watch. Yeah, for sure. There's no doubt about that. Look, Tennessee fans, uh, anything can happen, and uh, you know you love the prospect of of Joe Milton. So uh, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen this year? That's that's why we love this game of college football. It's it's one of the most unpredictable and. Any given Saturday, anything can happen to anybody, especially in the SEC. So, um, we, speaking of the SEC, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll go down the road to an SEC East rival, South Carolina. Uh, you know, Shane Beamer has, has uh, kind of brought his own version of Beamer ball to South Carolina, right? And uh, Spence brought in Spencer Rattler, and these guys finished the season – hotter than anybody. Nobody wanted to play South Carolina at the end of the year. They they took Notre Dame to the brink in that bowl game. Uh, that was probably one of the most exciting bowl games, honestly. Uh, and But but specifically, the to beat Tennessee and Clemson at the end of the year last year, I mean, that was like, that was one of the, the, the best endings to any South Carolina season. Usually, South Carolina is like the opposite. Like, they end, they kind of fizzle at the end. And and for depth purposes and everything, there's no reason they shouldn't have done that last year. That is good head coaching, I think. Um, as as goofy as Shane Beamer is, and, and I do think he's a goofball. Um, I maybe he's the right guy for South Carolina. What what do you think about him on media day? Um, there really wasn't a whole lot. I, I expected a little bit more uh, from Shane as a 
as a personality, as a character. Um, hey, I, you know, maybe he's trying to to trend away from being sort of the the fun team in the SEC and and be a little bit more about um, you know uh, South Carol having South Carolina be portrayed as more a, a more serious team or a team to take seriously uh, in the league. Um, but I, I, I like Shane Beamer a lot. I, I think he's again, a, a fun personality. Um, and I think he is the right fit for South Carolina. I think he's relatable. I think he's a, a young coach and a son of a coach and someone who, uh, has been a part of very successful programs, you know, in Georgia, in Oklahoma, um, you know, with his dad. And, um, I, I just think, you know, I, I think he is going to end up being a good coach and, and, I think he's got South Carolina in a really good position this season. Uh, I am super pumped to see Nicholas Harbor, uh, the five-star um, Ooh, he's a freshman coming in. Uh, you know, six five uh, runs like a a ten two hundred meter or something like that. I mean, this guy's a a freakazoid, absolutely. You know, and to couple with um, Spencer Rattler, who I think just started trending up towards the end of last season, like you mentioned. And um, I, I think that that, that is a testament to this coaching staff and how they are just squeezing everything that they can out of the talent that is, you know, Spencer, Spencer Rattler. And um, to see him develop last season from the beginning through the Georgia game. And then what he was doing at the end was, was really special. And um, I, I think he's poised to, to really, um, kind of end his college career in, in a, in a, a bright, uh, in a, in a bright way. Um, if, if, if South Carolina goes, goes seven and five this season, I, I don't think it's going to be Spencer Rattler's fault. I don't think that he's bearing that burden. I think that there are other, um, weaknesses in their lineup that, um, you know, I, I don't think that that Rattler's kind of the, the answer in a way, but I don't think that he's going to be, the one that uh, cost them their season or anything like that. Um, a lot, a lot returning on the defense. Um, they, uh, of all the transfers that, of all the transfers that they took, none of them are, are projected to start on the defensive side of the ball. So a lot of returning talent and a lot of uh, players who have, have been in this scheme have been in the program. So that's, that's usually a really good sign. Uh, and then on the offensive side of the ball, you know, it, it, it's funny because I don't even see on their depth chart Nicholas Harbor listed, which is which is funny to me. But I think that he does end up starting at tight end at some point. They have uh, grad transfer Trey Knox uh, slated to start ahead of him, but um, I would be and really they brought surprised. In, if, dude, they brought in so many tight ends in the transfer portal. Yes. It was crazy. I mean, if you look at those numbers, that – I mean, seriously, they brought in like five or six of them. I mean, it, it was well, wild, it was it was bro. three transfers and two true freshmen and Nicholas Harbor, who was listed as an athlete and is projected to play Jeez. tight end. Wow. So, a lot of new faces uh, and there. actually, I do see him now. And but and the reason it's throwing me off is because he's listed as their ex receiver, so that he's not listed mm. as a tight end. Interesting. Um, so they're essentially going to be running two tight end sets is what I'm gathering. That's what I was this, just but... about to say. That's why they brought so many in. They have a new offensive coordinator, Loggins, that they had brought in. And mm -hmm. I don't know a ton a lot about this guy, honestly, but um, it, that's what it looked like to me. And, and what I was reading, looks like they're going to go two tight ends a lot this year, kind of like Georgia did last year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, uh, Outside of that, so three transfers coming in on on the offensive side of the ball. Um, they they had a, they had a really good uh, uh, class uh, recruiting class coming in as well, and I just think that that US uh, well USC if you want to call them that or or USC Junior, um, however <laughs> however you see fit. Um, but uh, I, I think that they're they're trending in the right direction and kind of creating the snowball effect. Um, yeah. and. I guess I would have been very skeptical of the of the Shane Beamer hire for South Carolina when it first happened, right? I, I didn't know if anybody could could do well at South Carolina at at that time, and I think that he has exceeded expectations. 
and uh, has has really been a joy to have uh, in college football as a head coach and uh, in the SEC. Um, they've got a really tough task with UNC starting in week one, which I think uh, I think might be on one of our lists here coming up yeah. uh, in our next segment where, where we'll, we'll go through and, and document the best game of each week of the season coming up. So we're really excited to do that with you. But um, a really tough matchup for them in week one against UNC, against Drake May, who figures to be the number two overall pick. Uh, in the draft this upcoming season or off season, I guess. Um, and of course, uh, an SEC schedule outside of that. Uh, they draw Mississippi State from the West and they also draw Texas A&M from the West. Yeah, and then they end so, their year with Clemson. And yeah, like they do every year. So yep. um, again, seven and five, if they end up seven and five, it's not – that's not to say that they're a bad team. This is a really tough schedule. Um, of course, they've got Georgia like they do every year. They've got Tennessee like they do every year. Um, I don't see – Kentucky is going to be a really tough matchup for them late in the season. Um, I, I, I just – I could easily see five losses with this team, and it's not a knock against South Carolina. Yeah. Well – like you said, look, they're they're really good at making more with less, and I think last year they had a lot less. I mean, over the last couple of years, you've seen guys coming in and playing quarterback that have absolutely no business playing quarterback at the Division One level at, at any college, much less you know at a SEC school. Um, you know, and I, I got just a few notes here, and um, I, I just disclaimer here: I've got the same exact projected record as you do at seven and five uh that's that's exactly what i projected with this team and um you know we we talked about logins coming in at oc and how he brought in a lot of tight ends uh they're going to try to run the football and, and be a little more effective doing that um last year you know they had bell who ended up transferring to florida state he was a tight end and ended up playing excuse me ended up playing running back and then they had Marshawn Lloyd at running back who went to USC. So at running back, uh, you know, you really got two guys that, that you really got to have step up, Mario Anderson and Darion Joyner, who was a quarterback. So, um, you know, they're, they keep – they move guys around a lot from position to position, I've noticed. And the offensive line's not going to be any different. Um, unfortunately, Jalen Nichols got hurt in that spring game. Uh, hurt his knee, and it's not looking good. If if he comes back this year, it'll be at the end of the year. And three out of five starters were already gone, okay? So that makes it four out of five. And they brought in two offensive tack tackles, Sidney Fugar and Nick Gargolio. Um, so these guys are, I mean, honestly, they're question marks at best. And – they're going to be looking to shuffle a lot of things around on that offensive line, and it doesn't give me a great feeling. Uh, Josh Van is gone. Juice Wells is back. Uh, Eddie Lewis, this is a guy to watch out for right here, okay? Eddie Lewis comes in from Memphis, and he will start, and he will be very good. Um, Xavier Liggett is also back. I, I think the wide receiver room actually looks pretty good. I think that's probably a strength for this team, um, you know, as far as depth and – level one starters go. Um, I, I think you're pretty good at quarterback, too. you got a lot of experience there, obviously, with Spencer Rattler. I'm not quite sure if, if he goes down what what to expect there. but uh, And we talked about tight end, all the guys they brought in. This was an area to hear that concerned me, defensive line and linebacker. So you lose Jer Jordan Birch, and anybody from the South knows who Jer Jordan Birch is that played for South Carolina, and he leaves for Oregon. Uh, so we'll be fun to watch at Oregon, but, uh, you know, that hurts South Carolina fans' feelings because this is a guy that was going to contribute a lot and, and be a really good player for them. Um, they lost Gilbert Edmond uh, to FSU. Uh, a couple guys off this roster went to FSU. Um, and they picked up Jaron Willis from Ole Miss, uh, so it traded with an SEC team there. So with all that being said, it, it brings you back down to the secondary and you lose Cam Smith and Darius Rush to the NFL. Uh, so you had two corners in that defense last year, that a defense that wasn't that great. And they were good enough to be drafted and taken away from you. So 
now you're looking at a bunch of underclassmen to step up there. So with all that being said, seven and five, like I said, is my prediction. I I see this team losing maybe a game they're not supposed to and maybe winning a game or two that they're not supposed to. And I, I think that's pretty typical of college football teams, year in and year out. But this South Carolina team feels like more of what we saw last year in the fact that there's a lot of question marks and we're going to really get to see the coaching acumen of, of Shane Beamer this year as he tries to fill in some of these gaps and navigate this schedule. This is a tough – South Carolina's got a tough-ass schedule. I know they can't wait to to break up some of the SEC uh, schedules, you know, and things like that. I, I, I'm i sure they're looking for maybe a, a easier SEC schedule every once in a while, uh, but it, it's not coming this year, that's for sure. No, absolutely not. I think they've got one of the one of the more difficult um, schedules that, that I've seen <clears throat> in the SEC for this season. 